good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you are in the world. I am Rodney McGilvery, and this is Ancient Mysteries Revisited on Welt 95.7 FM in Fort Wayne, Indiana, coming to you every Monday and Wednesday at 2 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Also online at our website, www.ancientmysteriesrevisited.wordpress.com, and on YouTube at Ancient Mysteries Revisited. Recently, my co-host Bruce Cunningham decided to take a little break, so I'm continuing the show with a new guest of mine, Patrick Giles, who's joining us in a couple seconds, and we're hoping to evolve this program into something a little bit new, new and improved, a little bit more modern and casual, and joining us now is Patrick Giles. How's it going, Patrick? It's going good, going real good. How about you? Oh, good not to too bad. It's good seeing you as well. It's been a pretty busy couple of weeks trying to prepare, pr- trying to decide what, how I'm going to advance the show and keep it going without Bruce. Um, yeah, uh, I, that's right. You said he's going to leave the show, right? Yeah, it sounds like he's wanting to focus more on his volleyball team over in the Philippines, <laughs> which makes him? sense. I mean, he's got a big thing going there. Well... I wish my best to Bruce. He's uh, one of my best friends. Yeah, he's a good guy. Without him, this show would not be going on right now. So, Big shout out to Bruce Cunningham, who's All right. been advancing this uh, format on radio for a little while now. But yeah, um, we got a couple ideas going down. Uh, what do you got in mind, Patrick, for future plans for this show? Well... Of course, I'm always into archaeology, whether it's a mystery or the latest news. I love archaeology. I studied it for 25 years. I've written about it for 15 years. And any time we can talk about ancient Egypt, I'm always, always excited about that. Yeah, you've been uh, in uh, the realm of research when, when it comes to Egypt for a little while now. How long have you been researching Egypt and the pyramids? Uh, started about, uh, I would say... 20 years if you add it all up and uh, for 10 years solid I wrote about it every day wrote about three books on it mostly about how the pyramids were used to catch rainwater if you listeners didn't catch our last show Patrick was on and discussed how the Egyptians did catch rainwater uh, using the pyramid system Uh, you want to do a little recap of that Patrick just discuss your books for a little bit if you want and yeah it's it's one it's one of my favorite theories. I've, I had all kinds of theories about what the pyramids were for. I read every theory I saw, including the Egyptology theory, and finally said, uh, what if uh, I can come up with a theory? So I got in touch with an engineer, we worked it out, and we decided, we haven't discovered it, we decided that this must be the best theory, that the pyramids were used to harvest rainwater. That's that's the best we could come up with, and I uh, wrote a 600-page book to prove it. Very fascinating stuff. I mean, since I met you, Patrick, I've yet to hear this theory, and digging into your book a little bit since I got a copy, it's it's pretty interesting, and it seems like you got some tangible evidence to prove such. In fact, uh, tangible meaning you can actually see it. It's still there. You can go to the pyramids today, and follow the aqueduct. You can walk on at least three or four aqueducts are excavated, and you can actually walk on them from the front of the pyramid all the way down to the cistern. So it's all there. It's in the hieroglyphics. It's it's in the building design. It's it's all there. Now, tourists and other researchers obviously have walked through these aqueducts and seen it themselves. Uh, do they have any ideas themselves, like? other researchers on what that could be? I've never ever heard anybody say it could be anything else except a place where they dragged a coffin from the river to the pyramid where they say they buried it, even though they've never even found any kind of evidence whatsoever for a coffin, not even pieces of wood, you know. Yeah, I wonder, like, what brought about the idea of the pyramid being a big tomb i mean well for one thing it's in the middle of a cemetery Uh, (laughs) yeah that would be the biggest evidence (laughs) you know and if you're an egyptologist and all around you is bones 
you're going to say, well, this must have been the big, the, the big tomb. Yeah, the, the tomb of the kings. Or, you know, but why can't it be the, the really big temple? And it doesn't need to be a tomb. Like if you go to a cemetery today, there usually is one kind of nice looking building and everything else is bones. That kind of matches up other temples and even cathedrals and churches around the world. It's There's usually a cemetery close by for family Precisely. members. Precisely, yeah. So that yeah. would make perfect sense. So it does make perfect sense. In my, judging from the names of the titles, some of them are called uh, Ba, which is a spirit of the pharaoh, like the, the Ba pyramid. Oh, okay. So there is a possibility that they were used as cenotaphs, symbolic But that wasn't their main purpose. I think the pharaoh said, we're going to have a gigantic mountain that collects rainwater. Let's uh, devote it to me, and uh, I'll build it. It sounds like it it worked. I mean, there's no evidence of them collecting any other kind of water for use for drinking or anything. I mean, they couldn't get the water from the Nile River or any of the rivers close by. I mean, that's the first thing everybody tells me um you know did you know there's a nile river right by the pyramids i'm like yeah i I did know that i've been researching this for 20 years i know there's a a pier there you know but the romes didn't drink the water running through their towns you know the romans there's no water filtration plant there no (laughs) no they have aqueducts bringing in clear water and in the egyptians realm their world they didn't have springs everywhere like the romans did so they collected rainwater and sent it down an aqueduct to the cistern, just like the Romans. And today, by the way, nobody drinks the water from the Nile River. Nobody. Yeah, I don't think they've ever done that. And I don't, there's no reason to really believe that they would do such thing, except for they just say, oh, water, you're going to drink it. And that's the only No, same same with the wells. The wells are salty and they've always been salty. So what's wrong with rainwater? You know, it's perfect. Exactly. Um, well, you, what uses do you think they use for this uh, the water basin for? I mean, obviously drinking. Did they use it for uh, their religious practices or anything like that? Yeah. In fact, libation water is called keba. Okay. The keba. And this water that the regular people are drinking is also called keba. All it means is cool water. That's the translation. Keba means cool water. And that's what they use to wash their statues. That's what the libation ceremony is. They still do it in India today. They'll take the water and pour the finest water they can find over the statue, and that cleans it. And they would also drink the exact, from the same bottle, you know. That was the finest bottled water you could get is rainwater. Okay. Which, it's a little odd, because in modern times, in some places in America at least, it's (laughs) illegal to collect rainwater. Yeah, I think in Colorado... um, it is. That's because they want the water going to the river right? to support the river. Because the Colorado River is being drained by people like Las Vegas and Nevada. And oh, yeah. Big industry taking stuff over. Stuff like that. Yeah, the, of course. But um, nobody wants to collect the rainwater today except for their gardens because it's polluted. But back in the Egyptian times, it would not have been polluted. Right, yeah, they didn't have the factories right, lead. running off things into the river or, I mean, the pollution in the air. Right, especially lead. Right, yeah. Because you know? that's the main dangerous thing you don't want in your drinking water, and that comes from, that's in the air. So. Oh, definitely. Uh, uh, there has been uh, tests done now in, like, Chicago and big cities where there are some neighborhoods where the land itself is highly contaminated with lead. Right. Probably due to, like, major rainwater it it probably has to do with the rainwater and mostly because they have factories nearby. Right, yeah, acid, that's true. That's called acid rain, you know, and mm-hmm. they're definitely getting a lot of it. But it, mainly they were getting it because they were getting it from a source that was not the Great Lakes. They were getting it from the Great Lakes. And then they switched over for a cheaper area that was a, the Flint River, and that turned out to be extremely toxic. So they didn't have filters set in for the Great Lake water, which oh, is yeah. actually pretty good water, except for the thousands of gallons of gasoline that's got to be in there from all the ships and stuff that's true i mean considering that the the ships as many ships are there considering the size right there's got to be tons of pollution from the ships itself well it's constantly draining and it's constantly being replenished that's true i don't know how true this is but i've heard 
the water years above and years it, ago sorry, that sorry. like there's some Chinese bottled water companies that are coming over, cl- gathering a bunch of the Great Lakes water, bringing it over <laughs> to China to sell as bottled water. I wasn't aware of that. I mean, yeah, they'd they have to clean it first. Huge, huge bags, like these big plastic bags of some sort. It's crazy. Well, I could see them doing it. I mean, because the water farther north from Canada is extremely clean. Oh, yeah. It's only when it gets into the basin area where we are that it gets a little more polluted, I guess. Very true. Now, there's like a big Nestle company up, I think, near Flint, Michigan. Uh, are they getting their water directly, you think, from the Great Lakes? Who, Flint, Michigan? No, Nestle. Nestle? Yeah. I have no idea. I mean, my guess is they found a spring. Right. They usually try to get it from springs if they're there. Okay. But then they might be able to say the Great Lakes is clean enough to use. I don't know. Not familiar. Or they just slap a label on, collect it from the Great Lakes and say it's from a spring. (laughs) It's possible. (laughs) I wouldn't know. I don't know. That's one I don't know about. I know about some of the, the sources of spring water for sure. There's good sources. Oh, yeah. Um, are they as clean? Like in Amer- like you get these springs in America. Are they as clean as they say it is pure water? They used to be. I think they used to be, but a lot of the springs are surrounded by agriculture. Oh, okay. Especially um, cattle, and that seems to be ruining them. I know I'm from Gainesville, Florida. And the springs are under alert right now because they are being polluted from the cattle. It's ironic because they were cleaned up in the 70s. And they right. were, and so they were they, pristine. That wasn't that long ago, yeah. Right, and then they became pristine. I mean, there were people throwing cars into the springs, you oh know. My God. So they cleaned them up, and now they're being destroyed again by um, mostly cattle ranches. Oh, okay. So, yeah, these I'm assuming these ranches are probably right next to these... They surround them in many cases. Oh, okay. But a lot of them are surrounded by uh, natural parks. And those are the ones you want to go to. They're beautiful. So many great springs in Florida. It seems like these natural parks in America are slowly on the decline, though. <laughs> They're not taking care of them. They're not protecting them as good as they should. Right. You know? Especially with the kind of recent government shutdown. All the park employees were not paid to be there, so they were letting it go. Yeah, I heard about that. Which it, that's a very sad story if that these should natural not, parks are going down. When that becomes a low priority, have you heard about what happened in the Brazilian rainforest now? The new guy in charge, I don't remember his oh, name. Oh, we wiped out so Five much. times more yeah. than last year or the year before. Five times more. I mean... That's mind-blowing. We need that's, that forest. Yeah. <laughs> you know, not just for providing oxygen, but because it absorbs a lot of carbon dioxide. Oh, yeah. So yeah, the the um the trees are the big filter of the world almost. Absolutely. And we're getting more pollution as time goes by. It's scary. It's scary what's happening down there and the burning from all of that is oh, putting yeah. tons. I mean, when they cut them down, generally they burn almost everything. Right. Because they think that that replenishes the soil with nitrogen, which of course it does, but for like 2 years, <laughs> you know. Yeah. That's so you've ruined <laughs> a thousand years of you know, rainforest for five years worth of good growth for your cattle or whatever you're growing. Oh, that's that's so sad, man. It is. It's happening right now. Luckily, it's not happening as fast as it was, you know. Right. But still there, bad. There is a point in no return. And I hope, I hope it, we I haven't reached the point of no return. It's highly possible that we reach that. I heard this interview from a climatologist. It was on Coast to Coast Radio. And they were saying, so... What do you think? Have we reached the point of where it's too late? And he said, "Oh yeah, yeah, it oh, is I've too heard late." That too from it's too late. Scientists out there, <laughs> there's no way back. I mean, it's too late. Well, it's going to take at least ten years, and we're to re- if we stop now, it might be able to, re- to recover in ten or twenty years, maybe. If we stopped everything, and, and we're not going to stop. It's not, <laughs> it, yeah, it's not stopping. It's getting more progressive. Right, especially in India and China. Right. And uh, so that's a scary thought because with that in mind, we're all just now just waiting to the end. <laughs> I'm glad I didn't have kids. Sorry, I mean, I'm oh, not, I, I have two kids I'm, myself. I'm happy for uh, everybody who does have kids, but I'm glad personally because well, I worry so much is. about this stuff. <laughs> I worry more than most people. The world it. might come not come to an end in our time, but it might come to an end 
in my children's time, possibly. It, well, it might not come to an end. The world's going to keep going. Oh, yeah, the world will definitely keep but going. But our standard like, of living might civ- fall apart. <laughs> the current human <laughs> civilization. Yeah, you can't destroy the Earth. It will just won't be the same thing. I mean, it's been destroyed by meteors and asteroids completely. Oh, yeah. And it always comes back. But um, it's like you, you it would to be nice to eliminate have it the human population for it to renew itself. You'd have to do that, yeah. yeah. And it is sad that that's true. We're too smart for our own good. We came up with super things to make us com- comfortable, and it right. costs a lot. Well, if it's a it natural mechanism a lot. <laughs> for the the Earth to replenish itself and renew its renew itself, destruction of humankind is part of that process. Then it's always been, you know, species always disappear. I mean, the dinosaurs were super incredible. You know, they didn't survive the meteor right. or whatever hit. And that concept is in of itself it almost ties into the ancient mysteries like part of why we want to learn about what happened to the past is maybe to prevent maybe that destruction of some sort well that's what uh frank joseph one of my favorite authors is saying that the purpose of all these monuments especially the aztec calendar or the mayan calendar was to tell us when we're reaching a point where the earth will begin changing Right. However, it's changing. His his theory is that it's going to be solar storms that are going to make it hotter and hotter and hotter, and lead to an ice age because of all the melting of the. I don't know how it works, but yeah, this, they say that know. there's many huge solar flares that are active now than there were re- in recent times. That's what they say. I I don't keep up on that. I gotta admit. I uh, I don't keep up on that. You Probably hear as about much it. As I should. You're like, well, if that's happened. a real thing. <laughs> It's out there, but the thing about a solar storm, they they happen every single day. Mm-hmm. But a s- bad solar storm is one, it's like a bullet. It has to actually hit the Earth for it to affect our um, energy field that so surrounds like the, us. So the flare itself would actually phys- have to physically come and touch the Earth? and Well, it, it would have to send all of its energy. I don't know if it actually touches, but it would have to but send the its energy, energy level? Okay. directly to the Earth. Usually it passes the Earth or goes somewhere else. So Frank Joseph is saying that the solar storm is going to be pointing at us around this time of the year, around this time of the 36,000-year cycle that right. he, he mentions. So does he think that coincides with, like, the Aztec calendar? Yeah. Okay. He thinks that they were off a little bit, but it's happening. It's just not happening immediately, you know? Right, yeah. Like, before 2012, people were scared that the Aztec, Aztec calendar meant that 2012 would be the end date. Right. That, would that be might the be the start of the end date. That's the new theory. Yeah. Everybody who was well, like, yeah, once, it's going to happen. Once that doesn't happen, you got to come up yeah. with something right away to exactly. back that up. <laughs> yep. And the new theory is that it's the harbinger. It's just... Uh, oh, yeah. It's like all these end times. Here it comes. These end time supposed prophets say, oh, the yeah. end of the world's going to come here. And right afterwards, they're like, oh, we miscalculated. It's this date. Yeah. They yeah. always extend that date out every time. Yeah, it's real. Um, it's not in your best interest to give an exact date. <laughs> if right. You, you're if you're a prophet. keep making stuff up constantly. <laughs> yeah. Let's say it's coming. I'm not sure when exactly. I don't know. We probably keep going. The earth keeps going. It does. It's it's on a continuous cycle. Like, I do agree that, <laughs> that the Mayan calendar... There's some validity to it. I mean, the, the Earth does have its cycles. There's proof that the Earth has its cycles. Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And it does get destroyed within these cycles. Or, I mean, yeah, certain aspects of the, the Earth get destroyed during yeah. these cycles. The 100,000-year um, Ice Age cycle. Right. Which it sounds like, I mean, along with Frank Joseph, that, that might be the next one, another Ice Age. We're right at the end of a cold spell, and supposedly we're supposed to be entering a new cold spell. No, we're at the end of a warm, mm-hmm. entering a cold spell on three different super ice cycles. The 10,000 one, the 25,000 year one, and the 100,000 year one. So all these ice experts are like, well, why isn't it here? And they're saying that we're pushing it off with all the carbon dioxide we put in the air. Otherwise, it would have been here already. That's why our winter last year was unbelievably harsh in Fort Wayne, where we are. Minus, oh, yeah, minus 40 time. degrees in the daytime. Right, and it seemed like it extended, almost made it so there was no springtime. I don't remember the spring, except that we seem to be having a spring now. That's true. It's like 60 degrees in the morning. <laughs> this weekend has been wonderful in yeah. that regard. <laughs> yeah, it sure has. Yeah. But that's that's things that uh, are the warning signs of something 
that's p possibly going to come. The oak trees are losing their leaves earlier than anyone. Two or three people to, uh, have been saying, why are my oak trees losing their leaves? And I have to admit, I'm not from this area. I don't really know when they're supposed to drop. But if they're dropping early, that usually means winter might be early. Yeah, that would make sense. I mean, I don't see really the leaves falling around here probably till probably late October. That's what I would have thought. Yeah. But the oak trees are already dropping. Yeah, that's not a good sign. Either. And it's a nice cool morning, and it's what, August, you know? Yeah, we're... <laughs> Possibly entering fall weather right now. Then I almost needed a Which jacket. I thought about that the other day. Like when I I went to Chicago with the wife over the weekend, and cool. on the way back from to the train station, I was like feeling pretty chilly, thinking I should have brought a jacket. <laughs> what did you do in Chicago? Oh, I got a friend that lived up there. We went to his place, and uh, uh, we took him to this uh, club called the Exit Bar. And they had a really nice industrial goth dance night going on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Nice. So we danced the night away. Then actually, after we, we did that Friday night, then when we woke up Saturday, there was a large Japanese festival at the Midwest Buddhist Temple there in Chicago. Oh, I'll bet that was colorful. Oh, it was nice. They had taiko drumming going on. Nice. And Oh, you got to see that? Oh, yeah. That's daytime, right? Yep. Cool. Probably went there around like, Maybe three, three or four in the afternoon. Nice. It was really hot at that point, but it did cool down quick. I like Chicago. I did a conference there. Got to really know the place. Yeah, it's one of my favorite cities. The museum there. What's the museum there? The the field the museum. The field museum. Yeah. Beautiful. Oh, unbelievable. So many exhibits. And I, I, and their Egyptian exhibit is phenomenal. Oh, so much. They moved an entire tomb there. Yeah. From Saqqara. And what's the other museum? The Near Eastern Studies Museum over there. The um, Institute. The, uh, Is it just the Chicago Institute? The Chicago Institute. Yeah. yeah, I guess that's what it's called. But yeah, I've been to their museum too. A lot of Assyrian stuff. Oh, I love that stuff too. Me too. Yeah, uh, Chicago, they always get these passing exhibits, man, from all over the world. Oh, really I wish nice I could stuff. see them more. wish I could see them. I've also seen the art museum, of course. Amazing. Oh yeah, one of the biggest art museums around. Uh, last time I went to an art museum, though, I was up in Cleveland, Ohio, and th that was actually one of the biggest art museums I've ever seen. I have got to see this. And it's free admission. I've got to get to Cleveland. Well, you know, the New York Met is free. You know, they're two major museums. Well, they were when I went there. Yeah, which which is good. I mean... They um, should be free. It's hard enough to get people to go. Yeah. But if you make them pay, they're probably never going to walk in the door. <laughs> valid point. <laughs> Especially uh, for four people, you know. They're kind of uh, evolving these museums as well making it more interactive like nice. they, they got a lot of digital stuff like on the exhibit itself that you can interact with and oh uh, i gotta see it yeah highly recommend good it. for kids yeah i mean if and you adults think, you they gotta, need to make those interactive things more fun for us too well I, i've noticed a lot of adults are getting more into this okay because I, I it seems like more adults were interested at, at the cleveland museum at in the interactive areas than kids oh now that i love yeah yeah but it seems like nowadays, if you can attract kids to physical art, that's a blessing in and of itself. Because yeah. especially kids that are obsessed with media online, on like using technology, iPads and iPhones, all this technology. People are not out there in the w real world looking at physical art. And it is crucial. I never really appreciated art until I saw it in person. Right. And then suddenly you're like, wow. Actually, it was when I went to Greece. I have to admit, I was 19 before I really started appreciating art when I went to Greece and I saw ancient sculptures and I said, that's art. Now I get it. <laughs> you know, it's amazing. Yeah, that would change your whole perspective of reality and give you more of an appreciation of the world itself. Everything. And different cultures. Yeah. yeah. It wakes up your aesthetics, you know, your sense of aesthetics. Oh, definitely. Which is probably the sense of aesthetics is probably dying out. <laughs> it, I believe it comes and goes depending on the, ge like uh, every generation seems to do the opposite of their parents and vice versa, but I think it's going to make a huge comeback because I'm an artist. I, I had lots of art shows and then suddenly people stopped coming to art shows about 2004. 
because I was having a show or two or three or four every year, mm -hmm. and they just stopped coming. And I think that's going to change. People are going to finally say, wait, what is an art show? You know, because galleries are almost gone. In Atlanta, there used to be like 15. Now there's, I don't know, maybe four or five. I don't know. That's got to come back. It's so vital. It's got to come back, I hope. Oh, it's coming back. I mean, I've noticed at least up in Chicago, there's different kinds of galleries all over. Oh, well, that's Chicago. But the thing <laughs> is, that, well, yeah. They're smarter. <laughs> Indianapolis is becoming more art-oriented as well. There's different neighborhoods that are being revitalized in a definite artistic manner. Right. And Fort Wayne might be doing the same. I mean, you got the Wonder Commer Gallery, I'm which is not too far from your house. Yeah, I love that place. And I think it's going to take the middle class having money again. Almost all my sales were middle class people, and they are being so hard hit right now. You know, they don't have extra money to go pay for. Well, I've wondered, art. like, you know, people they'll go see the art, but do you think many people are out there buying the art at these galleries? Not as much as when I was selling art. I always expected to sell one, and usually I sold two or three. But the last two shows I had were one piece sold out of two different shows and that was really unusual then i started hearing the same thing from all my artist friends so i'm assuming that economic thing really did hit the people that we depend on the most the middle class people but right. i don't see them buying art now i hope they will soon if they start making money again <laughs> a lot of money yeah economically we're hitting a high time right now i mean there's people hiring all over seems like people are more financially well off but with that, they're now they're especially like in Fort Wayne. I've, I've heard that they're raising rent all over. Expenses are so much higher than they used to be. Yeah. And well, everything goes up except our wages. Right, which is <laughs> doesn't <laughs> it, make it's any not going to last. Yeah, no it's gonna not afford. sustainable. Yeah, you cannot afford something if if you're still making the same wage, and they're raising your cost of living. Right. Like there uh, used to be a cost exactly. of living w raise that companies would offer. I yeah, don't I think remember they're that. offering that anymore. I've never even heard it lately. Right. No. Cost of living is the only place I've heard that is in Seattle, where the minimum wage is fifteen dollars, I think. Oh yeah, they're they're definitely ahead of the game when it comes to bettering their self sustaining society, I guess they're We'll have to see. I've never well, been Seattle, to Seattle. Though, you got a lot of you got a lot of homeless there too. Well that's <laughs> what I heard was they raised the rents to such an amount and raised property taxes to such an amount that it drove the people that could have afforded it out of their houses. Oh, really? And that's why okay. they have such a problem with homelessness because, like I said, everything's going up except your wages, but especially in Seattle, things are going up. Seattle's like one of the up-and-coming cool places, and you've got to have money. It's kind of like New York, you right. know, $100,000. I just read this. You have to be making $100,000 a year to be a single person living in Manhattan. Oh, you wow. $100,000 a year minimum to have a decent life. Now, imagine that. I mean, I'm assuming most jobs there are not going to pay that. <laughs> they pay better than you would think. Like a teacher can get 35 bucks an hour. I have oh, a friend okay. who's a teacher up there. But it's not enough. Yeah. I know? mean, you definitely cannot afford the kind of living there. Like you could the here. housing there is crazy there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like two hundred thousand dollars for something you might pay forty thousand for here. Yeah, well, probably a lot more than that. I don't know. It's like that in Chicago. I, I got a friend up there who we just stayed with, and I think he said he pays over two grand for it's a two bedroom apartment, and it's close to downtown. It's it's nice, but I couldn't imagine that locally here. And it's they're they're raising. The apartment living to be on par with the big city Chicago living. It's not going to work. No. I think there's a lot of people moving here from there. I wish there Probably were more. To get, to get away from the high cost of living. but Yeah, exactly. They're going to have a rude awakening eventually when we keep the path we're on right now. <laughs> well, speaking of paths, we need to figure out what we're going to do for uh, up and coming shows. Maybe a. Uh, I wanted to well, get you, into you archaeology. You mentioned you want to do, yeah, an archaeology news segment of some sort. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I looked at it. I mean, there's things happening now, but uh, there was a lot more happening maybe two years ago when they found, like, another Viking horde. But lately, not a whole lot. It's kind of, yeah, it's kind of stagnant right now. Right now, it's kind of 
I don't know. Maybe it's summertime. You don't find as much. They're finding stuff in Egypt and Greece, but nothing huge. I think the Grand Museum just opened, or it's about to open. The brand new museum in Egypt. Have you heard about that? No. Tell us a little bit about that. It's called the GEM, G-E-M, and it will hold everything imaginable in Egypt, including colossal statues of Ramesses that are like four stories tall and stuff like that. And it's, it'll hold all the King Tut stuff because when I was in Egypt, they, I was just before the riots, and they almost got to the King Tut mask. Oh, really? If it wasn't protected by bars wow. and the metal doors, they would have gotten to it because the stuff that was outside there that was part of the exhibit, they did get to. They smashed some of it. You know, these 5,000-year-old Egyptian oh, wow. sculptures yeah. were smashed during that, during that riot. That would be devastating, I mean. It was to me. Yeah. <laughs> I'm glad I got to see everything before it happened. Now, did going over there seeing, like, the art over there in Egypt, did that influence your personal art? Always, yeah. Um, I, I've always loved making art that looks kind of Egyptian. I did tons and tons of that, especially paintings, because it was easier. But um, archaeology in general has affected almost all my work, but also Michelangelo. He's my favorite artist. Okay. The whole Renaissance period is just beautiful. Yeah, and people don't realize what a colorist Michelangelo was. He wasn't just like, I mean, you have to see the ceiling itself, but it's like the most unbelievable colors, almost trippy colors. Like, you've never seen anybody do colors like this before in oil because nobody can master it, but he's doing it in fresco, okay. which is a thousand times harder than oil painting. I tried it. I gave it up within two hours. Oh, really? Yeah. Hmm. It's incredibly difficult. Almost takes four or five people at one time for you to continue. That's how many he had when he was painting. And his pieces are insanely huge. Like Absolutely. <laughs> how long did it take him to, to paint the ceiling and the Sistine Chapel? I think it took him, it was either two years or three years. But it, it took an incredibly well, long time. Well, considering the size of that, that... Is it really impressive for two years? <laughs> oh, it's in, oh, he was working every single day, hardly taking a break ever. And I think it was longer than two years. It was like four years because the Pope was really upset about how long it was taking. Oh, okay. But it was the same Pope who loved art so much that he was paying Michelangelo a fortune to do that. I mean, one of his figures is like 15 feet tall. That's how big it really is. The figures are enormous. The chapel is 100 feet long, I think. Oh, wow. And 50 feet wide, something like that. I would love to have another renaissance of some kind in the art world. Me too. Where the focus is on these artists doing massive pieces. Yeah. I don't know if it's possible. Places. Because they are still doing it. But I don't know if it's possible to have another no, renaissance. Like Michelangelo or... We could have another figurative painter like him, maybe. But I don't think people want to pay for the figure anymore. They, they wouldn't. They want something unusual. So I don't, I don't know if a renaissance can happen anymore. We, the thing, like the thing society, about art is we've discovered we want everything. Stuff and massive quantity, not really good quality. I think art has gone to the movies. Well, that's true. Because in the art house, digital world is coming back too. Like I, I would true love to art see film that. is coming back. I would love to see that. Oh, I know film is always going to have the potential, but I want to see galleries again and coffee houses where. You know, if you have a mother and a child, you probably wouldn't go in there. Oh, you yeah. know, That's the old days. You know, people smoking and drinking coffee and beer and cussing. Society is too sensitive. For, for that to happen yeah. again. Yeah. Which is sad. I mean, because true art, I mean, it's a no-hold-barred exactly. climate. Like, yeah. And when you start <laughs> saying it has to be appropriate for children. It loses it. The well, whole then you're going to lose half the artists, first yeah. of all. Well, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> like me, I'll be like, well, if I can't paint a figure the way I want to paint it. I mean, if you have a problem with the human body, that's your problem, you know. But the art world should not be affected by it. But today it is affected by that. Oh, it definitely I know is. art museum, for instance, the one in Gainesville, Florida, will not show a nude figure. So that's a major museum. Yeah, thinking about going like to the previous galleries I've been to in Chicago, Cleveland, I don't think I even noticed any kind of nude body there. It's becoming a... Not even a tense. new painting or anything. Right. Yeah. It, I don't remember one either. Not even the Picassos that are there. I'm not sure if there's a nude there. You could get away with an abstract one, but 
but not like yeah, not a realistic. Mm-hmm. The Atlanta Museum of Art now they have nudes that are part of their primary collection. So kudos to Atlanta. And I think the the art classes at the colleges still offer. Oh, absolutely. Those kind of classes. You can still get a nude model. Yeah. In town, even it's not illegal. <laughs> you know, it's just not normal. Right. It's not as common. It used to be. Are there, do you think there's, common. there are guidelines to the galleries? Is, are there legalities involved with showing a nude painting or a sculpture? I don't know. I would say that they may have to put a disclaimer out for 18 and over or something, or there will be nudes. They may have to do something like that. I don't know. Right. Uh, only big gallery would have to do that. A small gallery, I don't think they would care. If you don't like the art, then get out. You know, exactly. this isn't illegal. <laughs> Which we should bring in our other uh, friend up in uh, Denver right now, Stephen. Soon, he's gonna come on, my friend Stephen Matz, and discuss some art, some of the occult, and some something along the lines of culture yeah. in the world. Yeah, call him up. Um, yeah, might as well bring him on now. Let me uh, send him a message. I'm going to hook him up through Skype. While I'm getting him on, though, uh, what are some other things we should add to this show in the in the near future? Um, I am always interested in the method- megaliths. They're finding more and more data now, which is suggesting that there is absolutely no way they move these megalithic sculptures. <laughs> they couldn't have done it without some kind of technology. I mean, like the ones in Skacha Huea San or something like that, where they took these massive boulders up a mountain and carved them so they're perfect. I mean, I just would like to find out more about that. But yeah, that's that's an interesting subject. I mean, do you, do you think it's possible that they had those boulders up there? They Like it no, they know exactly carving. where they came from. Oh, okay. they, they came from like 60 miles away. Oh, wow. <laughs> and took in directly up like 200 feet or something. Yeah, they had to have had some sort of crane or something, you right. think. I don't know. Well, the reason they say it can't be done without modern technology is that it's we couldn't do it unless we built a road first to have a track laid down for a crane that would ride on a track. And it, they say it would take two of those at their greatest capacity for us to do it. Right. And there is, as far as I could tell, no evidence of no. anything close to that. No, they didn't build a track. And if they did build a track, we know for a fact they did not have the metals available to make a strong track. It has to be a right. it were to make a crane for that matter. So how did they get it up there? I mean, you can't do it. It would like you would have to get like, I think something like 5,000 men under the boulder pushing at one time. So that's not going to work. There's not enough room for your hands. Right. You know, so how did they get four of them up there? You know, not just two of them, four of them. <laughs> yeah, so if if anyone out there listening has any kind of research <laughs> in this area, let us know. We'll yeah. have you on. We should yeah. have a discussion about that. We'd love to have anyone on that knows about the megaliths from Stonehenge to Egypt, anything, you know. Right. And also, uh, well, I mentioned at the last show, we should attempt some sort of e- or a pyramid project in my backyard. Let's build a pyramid. And we can keep updates on the show. Uh, I'll post photos and I'll post our progress on our website and everything. And I want to put uh, a stucco surface on top of it. Okay. That would be interesting. Make it more durable and see if that actually yeah, have you know, like a, makes the, it more efficient. A whole solid pyramid. It could make it more efficient. Yeah. We'll have to we'll we'll do a lot of research and a lot of experiments. Yeah. Well I've done that. the research and the experiments. We just have to build it. Yes. Well I'm excited to Me do too. That. Let's start writing up some plans for that soon. All right. Cool. All right, let's uh bring Steve and Matt's on. Let me call him real quick with Skype. Hey, good afternoon, Steven. Hello? Hello, can you hear me? Good afternoon. How are you doing today? Hey, I'm doing well, sir. How about yourself? I'm I'm doing good, man. I'm doing good. 
Good to hear. I got my uh, newest co-host, Patrick Giles, on board with us. Hey, how you doing? Patrick Giles, pleasure to meet you, man. Pleasure to meet you. Pleasure to meet you, too. So, yeah, this is going to start a new segment for probably the remaining time that we have this show. I'm going to do a art slash occult slash culture portion. And I'm going to have Steve and Matt join me probably uh, any episode he's willing to join me on, I guess. <laughs> what do you think about that idea, Steven? Oh, yeah, man. I love it. Uh, I'd be happy to do it. Uh, definitely. I'm, I'm going to be trying to shoot for, uh, you know, probably uh, I'll, I'll at least try to be there every other week. That sounds good to me. Yeah, we were just discussing, me and Patrick, about how it'd be nice if there's a new art renaissance coming up because not many people right now, it seems like, in our culture and society in America seem interested in physical art. I mean, it seems like maybe we, we might be on the the resurgence of new art galleries and stuff. Hopefully we can get a lot more people out in the public to come see physical art. Yeah, well, I think that um, I think that what we're seeing right now, what we're witnessing is the emergence of more of the digital uh, gallery, the digital exhibition, uh, because it is in that it's, uh, you know, the age of convenience. And, uh, so that's why with intersect, what we try to do is just bring it right to the people. And, uh, you know, you bring as many as you can, you know, that is true. I mean, you, you got the whole world as your audience with intersect, which, uh, do you want to give our listeners a little rundown of intersect a brilliant gallery i'd say well thank you i I appreciate that rodney um yeah well intersectart.com uh forward slash rogue gallery uh that's where you're gonna that's where you're gonna see the actual digital gallery and uh we do we run shows every month uh on third friday of every month this month it'll fall on the 16th uh and we just bring in uh a whole like this month we'll have uh the great Saturno Budo. We'll have Dave McDowell, uh, myself, Gus Romero the Fourth, uh, among uh, many others. Uh, we're still getting that together, of course. Sounds good. I'm excited to check out what you got coming up this next Friday. Which, All right. Uh, on, which I, I kind of got the hint that uh, you're possibly working on another film too. Is that correct? Uh, yeah. Uh, we are currently uh, shooting uh, footage for the uh, the follow-up to the Books of Laba Fire. Uh, that will be the uh, the film, uh, the Books of Laba Water, and that will be uh, focused on his 16th handmade book, Water. Uh, and kind of, uh, you know, it will be in the same vein to a certain extent, uh, but... Uh, Hopefully, you know it'll be a, uh, it'll be just you know next level a little bit a little bit more up there. But we'll see. We'll we'll definitely see what we get out of this, and uh, I'll keep you guys updated as that goes along. I'm also working on another project, uh, directing it currently uh, called Hedo Magetto. Uh, so that's something that's kind of in the works. Uh, more on that to come. But, uh, yeah, you know, we got some good stuff coming up this month. I think mostly this month it'll be, uh, you know, visual art, painting, maybe a little bit of uh, music. Uh, if we could maybe get somebody in there to do some music, wink, wink. <laughs> I'll be on board for sure. You know that. <laughs> Actually, right on, I'm man. thinking I'm about, you know that, I sent you that second coming track. I'm thinking oh, of yeah. doing some sort of short film piece for that if you're possibly interested in contributing to that uh maybe we could release that on a upcoming third friday you know that that sounds like it would be great man um but uh, let's definitely talk some more about that and figure that out uh because that's a i love that track man um that whole album that you guys are doing right now or is that album finished or are you guys still kind of going along with that? We're, the, uh... we're trying to play with the idea on what we should add next. I think we're going to do a couple more tracks to finalize it. I mean, we just we just did a, our first punk song as a group on this album. I think we're going to add one more punk-sounding track, and then 
maybe end it with more of a subtle electronic track. But the album should be complete hopefully within a month. I think maybe maybe tomorrow we might uh, work on another track. We'll see. You see, that's what I love about it. So uh, it's I, you know, I really can't honestly personally think of. I've never seen an album kind of come to fruition like that. Uh, you know, where it, it's 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 fascinating to watch it evolve and come to. And I think it's that's uh, it's a, an innovative approach. Well, I appreciate that, Stephen. Um, it is a it is innovative in a sense. It's uh it's strange because we'll go and we'll practice. We'll try to practice like every other week now, and we go in there with nothing planned, which is crazy. We'll go in there and right off the bat, ideas start coming together, and within three or four hours, we have a finalized track, and somehow, at least so far. It comes together just completely naturally, with no planning involved. Well, it sounds absolutely magical. Yeah, it feels that way. It feels like we're invoking some s- strange energy, and it just automatically comes comes through us. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you're. Uh, I guess you're taking your place at the. You know, it's your the the linkage. You know, you're you're going back to the the past masters and uh you know standing on the shoulders of giants to a certain extent of course what you guys are doing is uh i'm not really hearing anybody else do too much uh, anything too much like that and i think that has to do with just the spontaneity of the whole project like we're not trying to be something really we're just it's just happening well that's special and you gotta definitely uh, appreciate that uh because it's it's hard to find collaborations like that. Very true, and it's kind of a special collaboration too. My my friend Dylan, who's my uh, he's my uh, co project collaborator, I'd say, where he came from one of the first, if not the only, other experimental band here in Fort Wayne called the Rupert Bomb, probably about fifteen years ago. I remember randomly seeing the Rupert Bomb for the per- first time back then, and it was like on par with like seeing like Throbbing Gristle or something live. It was intense, and I just recently reconnected with him, and he was just the perfect fit for the show Gotham into project. Oh yeah, it's uh, I gotta check out that that earlier stuff. You said it's called Ripper Bomb. The Rupert Bomb. I'll send you some links to his stuff. I'm sure he's got a lot of it online right now. Oh, yeah, man. Definitely do that. Definitely do that. Yeah, I mean, you guys are doing some great work, so keep it up. And like I said, I love the uh, just the way that it organically comes together right before everybody's eyes. That's, that's pretty fearless, I think. For me, personally, I like to hold on to my stuff until I'm, you know, it's, I'm like, okay, it's all together and it's and i know how it's going and that's it's uh it's interesting because it's it's just it's fearless and i respect that well i'm glad you think so i like to have my art evolve in front of everybody almost like because the the project itself is very transformative and it's all a big transmutation that i'm hoping the listener is involved with as well i'm hoping my music is or changing the listener as well well to a certain extent would you kind of, i mean that's kind of uh akin to uh, performance art like uh, you know kind of the vibe that performance art has in a way it's there it's now it's immediate and it's interesting because you're going in the studio and you're doing this but then you're how you're you know and it's evolving so it's almost has that edge of uh of performance art to it very true i, I like that idea it's- kind of what we're trying to go for it's definitely something new um and it's it's open-ended too i mean we could go anywhere with this sky's the limit for sure now uh i was gonna ask you steven uh what kind of a cult background do you have oh well you know i'm an armchair uh <laughs> i'm mostly an armchair guy okay i uh i've read uh quite a bit um I of course, you know, I've I've got my affiliations uh with the uh 
uh, you know, uh, different uh, people that I know and things like that. Um, but, you know, nothing too heavy. I just, uh, I'm more of armchair kind of guy. But there has always been the interest there, and I've always studied it rather uh, extensively. And what uh, area are your studies usually in? Left hand um, well, type of stuff, or yeah, I mean, it it seemed like it started out that way. A lot of interest, I guess. You know, it's kind of the same when you're, a te- you know, when you're uh, sort of in that teeny bopper stage, and you're like all of a sudden like going for guys like Crowley. Uh, you know, you discover Diary of a Drug Fiend or uh, Moon Child, one of the novels, and it kind of gets you into it. And then you'll go for Liber Legis or uh, uh, Book Four. Or, uh, you know, the, the different things like that. Right. Uh, of course, that led me more into the realm of uh, Austin Osmond Spare, which personally, I, I guess it's kind of a thing where you either like the Beatles or Elvis, well, you either like Crowley or, or Spare. So I err more on the side of uh, AOS. Um, and then, of course, uh, you know, uh, I've had my uh, fair share of... Uh, the COS literature that you read, um, you know, Satanic Bible, uh, Witch's Notebook, Satanic Witch, all that sort of LeVay stuff. Uh, studied the grimoires for a while, a bit. Uh, you know, like the old, uh, the French ones with, uh, uh, that goes into Lucifage and stuff like that. Okay, yeah. Um, the grimoires are very complex. Uh, there's a, large amount of different knowledge there oh definitely definitely and it's uh not something that is quickly or easily assimilated oh that's for sure so um yeah i definitely for those reasons i definitely consider myself more of an armchair and uh less of a uh uh less physical practitioner yeah yeah, that's that's that would be the best way to describe it. I would say that honestly, most of my uh, uh, practice would be in my work itself. Uh, I feel that when I go into the studio, when I am working on a, a painting, or I'm uh, you know writing, or I'm working on a film, that I come into like you say, you invoke something, you come into a contact with uh something on the other side of that wall on that other plane and i I, you know it it definitely informs the work and because by the end of it you know you find yourself in a kind of almost trance-like state and you look at the clock and nine hours has gone by so (laughs) yeah that's very true and i've always considered art the true spiritual practice Definitely, yes. Very much like uh, William Blake, the imagination is uh, is a sacred and holy thing. Very true. Well, uh, hopefully in the future, maybe our next episode, uh, we could bring along some other guests in this area to join us, Stephen. Uh, Definitely. Yeah, I got a friend up in Chicago who goes by Winter Lake. He's he was on one of our previous shows discussing the history of Lucifer. And he's willing to join us on multiple segments as well. He, I guess he's also a remote viewer. So I'm, I'm going to think about it for a little while and see if maybe he could do some remote viewing on air in regards to maybe the ancient mysteries, like different areas. Yeah, that would be great. Yeah. So it's... Like uh, remote viewing, uh, it's a close to astral projection, correct? Oh yeah, very very similar. Remote viewing, pretty much, uh, seems like it could take place in any time period, where you could go back to certain events and astrally be there, so to speak. You still there? I hear a weird beeping noise. <laughs> Oh, that was weird. Yeah, what was it? That was strange. It sounded like it was hanging up or something. Oh, well. Yeah, it just went dead all of a sudden. Can you hear me? Yeah, you came back instantly. Yeah, I think it was, uh, I think our friends uh, at Skype are having a little problem. (laughs) 
they don't like hearing about uh, occult information, I guess. <laughs> Oops, I guess, I guess we should just leave it at the astral projection. The remote viewing maybe is a little too practical for certain uh, of today's uses, you know. Maybe it's... Uh... <laughs> maybe that noise was someone trying to remote view this conversation. <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> We're being tapped right now. We're being tapped, all right. <laughs> all right, well, that'll probably wrap up this portion, Stephen. All right. I'm Sounds glad like you could jo join us on this show. We got many great ideas that will come to fruition soon. And, I mean, this show right now is kind of open ended. So, if you got any other ideas that you'd like to shoot our way, let us know and we'll implement them. Definitely. Right on. Well, and enjoy the rest of your day, Stephen. It was good, good talking to you. Thanks so much. You guys do the same. And right. uh, you have a great Thank rest you. of your show. Thank you. We'll catch you later. All right. Thanks, man. Bye. Bye. All right. Well, that was Stephen Lee Matz from Denver, Colorado. He uh, runs a art, online art gallery called Intersect, which I've been a part of for a little while now. Uh, he releases stuff every third Friday of every month. So I'll post some stuff about that. I'll post the website for Intersect on our Facebook page and our website as well. Um, got anything to add to any of that, Patrick? What do you think of maybe having a remote, remote viewing session on our show sometime? That'd be interesting. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I've um, heard of people doing that before. Not necessarily during the show, but I'd like to see one happen during the show and see what happens. Yeah, what I don't, would, what I, I would don't we think view? I've ever, like, I've only, like, seen remote viewing go down on, you know, your goofy paranormal shows, like Ghost Hunters and stuff like that. They'll try to have, like, a remote viewer on at a yeah. haunted house or something, and uh, well, it'd, it'd be um, interesting to maybe... There's the, this guy named Major Danes. I think he's been on Coast to Coast Radio lots of times. We Re might have remote to look, viewer. look him up then. Yeah, yeah, if he's still around. There's got to be the school of that guy. You know, he had a school or something. Oh, so. yeah, then he's probably got even students out there that might be interested. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah, if, if you guys are out there, we'd like to hear from you. Yeah, if anyone's out there remote viewing, you hit us up and we'll have you on the show. I mean, I got some ideas because it'd be interesting. Maybe we could do some ro remote viewing regarding stuff in Egypt to see what really went down there or something. Yeah, yeah, I think uh, people have tried. I know Edgar Casey. You might say he was remote viewing. I don't know. I, th I think he said... He seemed like he was tapping into something like that. Yeah. I think he had people come into his body that were there. Like right. that kind of a thing. Spirits that were there and still have the memory of it. So oh, kind of like a seance. Yeah. I yeah. Guess. Oh, yeah. He was big on seance. Mm -hmm. But I think he was completely unaware of what he was saying. So that's different, too. Right. Yeah, because usually a seance person, they're well aware of what's going on. Right. But he was more possessed then, sounds like. Well, he's times. called the sleeping prophet. Oh, okay. So they would come into his body when he fell Well, he would fall asleep when they entered him. So he said he was completely unaware of anything that was said. Interesting. Like, yeah. Did he have people there then recording the session? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, there are actual recordings of Edgar Casey. Uh, it was definitely in the 30s or whatever when they had recording system, uh, whatever, however they did it. Now, wasn't he the guy, too, who... Uh, kind of went against the uh paranormal concept like didn't he kind of deny the existence of like aliens and stuff or am i thinking somebody else i don't know if um they ever breached on that subject with edgar casey that would be great to find out there are lots of people now we should actually get a hold of some of these people who say that they have been speaking to aliens it'd be great to have one of oh, them on the show. show yeah yeah i just read a book i've I, I name, do have some. They are there. Somewhat old messages from a few months ago. People contacting me, wanting to be on the show, who say they've been like abducted. Well, <laughs> again, I will mention Coast to Coast because they're my model mm -hmm. for um, this show and for any show. I think they're a great model. Well, they're the In fact, perfect every, model. For everybody's this. copied yeah. what they've done. You know. Well, they like to have anybody on. Anybody call in that believes they're abducted by aliens and you can usually weed out the ones that probably weren't really you right. know it's usually the same story and but uh there's definitely the people who have been abducted also have the same story where they say they've met aliens and human-like creatures on the same 
place in the same place right and that's what it kind of makes it hard to decipher sometimes what is true and what's not because if yeah. they're having the same experience which could be the real same experience but if they're also having the same experience because they're go, they go online to research oh what's an alien, alien right. abduction let's, right yeah right <laughs> but well, no it's a great idea we should like to do that too we well, well, that. Well, maybe we can implement uh, even a call-in show in the future where people once people get the idea of what we're trying to accomplish with an abduction show maybe they can we can schedule a call-in show i think we should just see who wrote these books and send them an email yeah no we will definitely do that that's for sure i'll go check it out after we're done find people also who uh might think that they are able to remote view egypt you know if they think that they are we'd like to talk to you yeah, I'm going to send my friend who, he goes by Winter Lake. He's an author. Okay. And he, I guess, specializes in remote viewing. He says he's a remote viewer himself. I'm going to see, I'll, I'll pitch to him the idea of remote viewing on the show in regards to ancient Egypt or anything in regards to just ancient mysteries in general and see if you'd be interested. I'm sure he would. Yeah. Yeah, we can just have them Skype, just like now. That's a great system. Yeah. Very, very uh, adequate for what we need right now. Yeah, and if you don't have Skype, that doesn't matter. Well, we they can just call do a in. phone call. Yeah, we got a telephone here in the studio. Yeah. Um, email us. You could email us. So we could. It'd be hard to do what, a, what a is text the, chat. What is here, the but email? <laughs> what is the email? Uh, you can email me at ancientmysteriesrevisited at gmail.com. And also, uh, it, you could just send us a Facebook message on our Facebook, too. Just facebook.com slash ancient mysteries were visited. And uh, I usually try to respond pretty quickly, so you won't be waiting multiple days to hear back from me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And the great thing about emails is they usually don't change as often as phone numbers. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, you don't have to accidentally have your email wiped out and right. get a new one. <laughs> yeah, it's in the air somewhere. Right. Thank you, Google. Well, that probably wraps up this show. It's good uh, having you on this time, Patrick Giles, now discussing the future of Ancient Mysteries Revisited. Yeah, thank I you. Mean, things are changing rapidly right now for the better. I mean, I feel like right now, I personally am in, in a very transformative state of my life, and this coincides with that. Awesome. I am too. I'm at the point now where I've written so many books, I would really just like to talk to other people who have written books. And I think that's what this show is a good direction for this book, for this. Uh, that's kind of how I'd like to see it go. You know, if we know of a good author and no one else has heard of them, let's get them on. Yeah, that's one thing I really want to do, which I was speaking with you. And there's so many authors about, in Fort Wayne. Yeah, re not specifically releasing people's books on our website, but right. maybe doing short advertisements of some sort where people can right. have their books available on their own website. I mean, especially if you want to do a short interview. Yeah. You know, which that's a decent trade off interview for a little advertisement. That's segment. usually the deal. Yeah. That's you. Right. That's why I did my interviews. You know, you know, you're not going to get paid for interviews. Not most people. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> not unless you're famous. Right. And I don't think we're going to get anything anyone of that caliber who's going to say, oh, give us some money first. <laughs> yeah, we probably won't have you on the show if we can't afford you, but maybe in the future. Yeah, and you better be damn good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you better be real famous. <laughs> <laughs> little side note, though. Uh, I am in the process of planning on releasing Patrick's book on our website. That's one of my main plans. I do want to have like a little store eventually on the website. Yeah, just another outlet for my books. Right. You know, they're they're going to be on Amazon and Barnes and Noble, but I mean, your every research venue is, is pretty good. extensive. I mean, you got some fairly thick books out there. Yeah, <laughs> I have some books that nobody will ever finish reading. I think I've never seen anybody that can read my entire six hundred book that mentions every single pyramid complex that was built and how each one functioned. Yeah. It's a pretty big book. I have a much more condensed version of that same book. Or even like your Egyptian uh, dictionary. That's a right. great reference book. Oh, it's going to be huge because I've taken something that was impossible to read, and that's why no one used it, 
and I've made it absolutely modern. You can it's it's as readable as a modern dictionary now. And uh, I wonder if, if do you think you could condense something like that into like a pocket thing, and people could bring that to Egypt with them? Well, people have done that already. Oh, okay, there, I actually have seen a couple of them, but they're not very good, and they're too complicated. I could definitely make an easier one. So that's an idea. Or they can even take it to the art gallery because there's a lot of Egypt um, portions of art galleries all over America right now. Oh, yeah. Yeah, every every major gallery has Egyptian stuff. Hopefully they'll get to hang on to it. There's been so much reparations. They want their art back. You know, Egypt won't let a single piece leave their country now. Right. So Not a single piece can leave their country. The galleries are extremely lucky right now. They yes, have the ones they that have, have them. Yeah count your blessings because you're not going to get any more not unless they've already left the country years ago and they're available for purchase somewhere but you can't you can't buy anything out of egypt you can't just go down there and say oh how much right yeah didn't you have a little bit of problem doing that yourself bringing some no i brought back uh souvenirs little rocks from every place i went to and i didn't realize that even that could be construed as um taking artifacts out of the country but I'm pretty sure that almost all of my rocks were rocks. Right. <laughs> Just rocks. Do you think someone would, like, g- get in major trouble right now if they had even, like, a small artifact? It already has happened. Like, yeah. Uh, do you uh, think they would get arrested yeah. for that? Yeah. Okay. Um, just, I think, three years ago, a Canadian student was 14 years old, was on the Parthenon, and she picked up a rock to have a selfie taken, and they stopped her for removing artifacts and took her to jail for two days. So that's a 14-year-old. Oh, well, yeah. If a regular, not a minor, did it, going through an airport and got caught, it's an automatic $10,000 fine and possibly up to one year in prison if you do that. Yeah, that's... That's everywhere. That's every... That's pretty extreme for... That's on both sides. If you get caught taking it out or if you get caught bringing it into America... Okay. Both ways. It's uh, okay. Yeah. It's so sm- once you reach America again, customs that they found the artifact on you, they'll if, send you back to Egypt. No, if if they thought it was an artifact, they would um, get in touch with the Egyptian authorities and probably, if they thought it was serious enough, then you would probably have to go to court there. Okay. In Egypt. And that, <laughs> that'd be very risky then. Yeah, you don't want to do it. Just don't even yeah, do it. Just. Whoever's out there in Egypt listening, do not take anything. Don't (laughs) pick up rocks from any archaeological site in any country anywhere because it is illegal in every single country. And that is good to know, I mean. Yeah, because you think you're picking up a souvenir. Right. And you're like, oh, it's just a piece of pottery. And even if it wasn't even close to the main sites, I mean. Oh, anything. The law is anything in the soil, on the water, or at an archaeological site or anywhere within the borders of the country, wherever you found it. That's, it doesn't matter. So, uh, it doesn't matter. risky for like people selling souvenirs too. A guy found a gold coin when he was scuba diving in Greece. Okay. And he never, he, he never thought he was gonna get into so much trouble. He got into more trouble than you can possibly imagine. Something wow. like a $20,000 fine and lawyer fees and all kinds of stuff. He probably spent a lot more time there than he wanted to, that's for sure. Yeah, yeah, he got stuck in Greece. And if you're not at a resort in Greece, it's not as much fun. (laughs) Especially (laughs) if you're in a jail. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Oh, man. Well, thanks for having me on. Hey, thanks for joining me. Um, This will be a good, I think, a good uh, continuous uh, relationship that you have for the show. I'd like to do it while I'm in Fort Wayne. I'm not always in Fort Wayne, but maybe we could do it. We could do a remote Another way. I mean, yeah. grab yourself a Skype account. <laughs> oh, I got one. There you go. Yeah, Skype is it. It's free, man. Yeah, it'd be nice, like, just building up a small Ancient Mysteries Revisited family that we yeah. can rely on different people to come on. Yeah, that would be a great idea. Yeah. No, that's, that's you know, why have the same co-host? Exactly. Because uh, you can direct the, you know, you can keep her rolling you know the way you want to keep it rolling and you know how to do all this stuff so oh yeah and it's been fun this is definitely a passion of mine and i do not plan to stop anytime soon that's good that's good news because this business is all about passion uh ancient mysteries is all about being passionate about it because 
Believe me, I've, I know a lot of girls personally that do not want to hear a single word about this. So you have yeah, to really be passionate about it if you want to do this. Yeah, you're not trying this. to pick up girls by doing this shit. No, this, <laughs> you will not pick up girls doing this. <laughs> right on. Well, thanks again, Patrick, and I look forward to our next show. I mean, we, we'll do a lot of planning, but uh, it definitely won't take long to get on board with what we're going to be doing next. All right. All right, until then, I'm Rodney McGilvery. And I am Patrick Giles. And this is Ancient Mysteries Revisited on Wealth 95.7 FM in Fort Wayne, Indiana, coming to you every Monday and Wednesday at 2 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Also online at ancientmysteriesrevisited.wordpress.com. On YouTube at Ancient Mysteries Revisited. All right, we'll see you again next time. We are the Deep Programming Program. Nice.